To access all audiobook recordings without ad interruptions, please visit the links below. Thank you for your support. Blood Lies by Grover Fur. Chapter 15 An Examination of the Falsehoods in Bloodlands Since Bloodlands is not an attempt to give a truthful account of the events it discusses, it is something else. An attempt to convince the reader, including the academic reader, that it is a truthful account. In other words, Bloodlands is a work of propaganda disguised as a work of historical research or a summary account of works of historical research. Bloodlands is a book that intends to mislead its readers, and it has been very successful. The main reason for its success is what I have called the anti-Stalin paradigm. Bloodlands tells its readers what they were, broadly speaking, already knew, that is, thought they knew, that Stalin and the Soviet leadership were morally evil people who deliberately murdered millions of people and so were, broadly speaking, like the Nazis. Bloodlands fills out the paradigm of the Stalin and the Soviets as evil paradigm, with examples and scholarly-looking documentation, much as hot air fills out a balloon. In addition to the techniques of scholarly misrepresentation and misdirection, other factors are involved. Chief among them is the power of the anti-Stalin paradigm. This epidemic of self-imposed blindness exists because there is no powerful institution that is devoted to the pursuit of historical truth. The historical profession is supposed to be such an institution, but it is not, at least as regards Soviet history of the Stalin period. In this field, falsehood is rewarded as long as it serves anti-communist purposes, while the truth is discouraged or penalized when, as is usually the case, it does not serve those purposes. The techniques of misdirection employed in Bloodlands are not original or sophisticated. Once they have been pointed out, they appear almost transparent, but they have fooled dozens of reviewers, including academic reviewers. At the time I am writing this, May 2014, I have yet to find a single reviewer who has identified even one of the dozens of falsifications in Snyder's book. If someone were to write a book accusing the American government of atrocities on the scale of those Snyder falsely attributes to Stalin and the Soviet leadership, we can be certain that many scholars would check every statement and examine all the evidence. That up to now, no one has done this is, no doubt, due in part to the fact that in Bloodlands, Snyder is simply telling people that which they have assumed to be true all along. What we have done in the present book is simply to apply to Snyder's fact claims, accusations, and allegations against Stalin, the Soviet leadership, and pro-Soviet forces in Bloodlands, the skeptical attitude that any careful reviewer of a book alleging crimes by the United States government and leadership would adopt. The result is devastating to Snyder's book. Within the anti-Stalin paradigm, a number of rhetorical techniques of misdirection are employed in Bloodlands. In an earlier work, I called the different kinds of falsification in Nikita Khrushchev's secret speech a typology of prevarication. Footnote, Khrushchev lied, chapter 10, pages 137 to 158, end of footnote. In that work, I was able to show that what Khrushchev stated in this infamous speech was false. Because Russian authorities still keep most primary source documentation of the events of the high politics of the 1930s top secret, in most cases I did not have enough evidence to discover what really happened, only enough to prove that more than 40 revelations made by Khrushchev in that speech are deliberate lies, and that 20 more are false, probably but not demonstrably deliberate falsehoods. In The Murder of Sergei Kirov, I discussed the studies by Matthew Leno, Osmond Eggy, and Alla Kiriliana. I discovered that these scholars had tortured the available evidence in order to reach the only conclusion congruent with the anti-Stalin paradigm that Kirov's assassin, Leonid Nikolaev, was a lone gunman, and that Stalin fabricated the criminal case against everyone else. 
In the case of Kirov's murder, we do have enough evidence to prove that those persons convicted of the murder by the Soviet court in December 1934 were indeed guilty. But I did not give a summary or theoretically informed account of the errors and methods of misdirection that these prior scholars used. In the case of Bloodlands, I think such an account is warranted. The fact claims against Stalin and the Soviets are so universally false and the failure of expert reviewers to notice this so complete that we are forced to admit that the techniques of falsification in Bloodlands have been successful. If they have fooled the experts, they will also fool the general reader. These techniques of falsification are simple in principle, but they are only disclosed as simple in practice if one studies them closely. The widespread acceptance of the anti-Stalin paradigm discourages any attempt to verify fact claims that are convenient to that paradigm, since the process of verification dismantles the paradigm itself. A review of the techniques of misdirection in Bloodlands may prove helpful in warning the reader against naive acceptance of the anti-Stalin paradigm. Under its controlling influence, every piece of evidence is bent to fit it, while everything that does not fit it is ignored or discarded. In the ideologically charged field that is Soviet history of the Stalin period, no accusation of wrongdoing against Stalin, the Soviet leadership, or pro-Soviet forces, no matter what its source, should ever be accepted as true unless it has been thoroughly verified. The sooner this fact is generally recognized and the sooner the practice of verifying evidence that fits the anti-Stalin paradigm is taken seriously, the better for those who wish to discover the truth. Methods of Falsification in Bloodlands Avoidance of objectivity takes different specific forms. There are many different ways to make fact claims without evidence. Technique of Deception, Begging the Question, BQ Characteristics, Petitio Principi, Assuming That Which Is to Be Proven Example the mass starvation of 1933 was the result of Stalin's first five-year plan, implemented between 1928 and 1932. Bloodlands, Chapter 3 Technique of Deception, Bias of Omission, B.O. Characteristics rely on the reader's ignorance. Example Poland never surrendered, but hostilities came to an end on the 6th of October, 1939. Bloodlands Chapter 4 Snyder barely refers to the real genocide, the Volhynian Massacres. Chapter 13 Technique of Deception Fabrication Characteristics Statements that are anti-communist bias only, without any evidence at all. Example Stalin's First Commandment, Another Snyder Fabrication, Chapter 3 Technique of Deception, The Big Lie, B.L. Characteristics, Repetition of the Same Falsehood Over and Over to Give the Reader the Impression that it has previously been established as true. Example, The USSR and Nazi Germany were allies. Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact was an agreement to partition Poland, joint invasion of Poland. USSR and Nazi Germany want to eliminate Polish elite. Technique of Deception Communism, Nazism, CN Characteristics Miss no chance to compare if not to equate them. Communism is to be linked with Nazism whenever possible, regardless of logic. Often, the attempts to bracket the two together is awkward, even bizarre, and sometimes seemingly irrational. The rationality lies in the BL repetition. The aim is to get the reader used to the comparison as though it were a natural one. Nazi actions are blamed on the Soviets whenever possible. Communist motives must be made to appear as similar as possible to Nazi motives. Example Gulag prisoners were slave labor, Bloodlands Chapter 3. Did Soviet cruelty lead to support for Nazism? Chapter 4. Snyder terms for Stalin's anti-Hitler move a pro-Hitler move. Chapter 7. Snyder noting a person's nationality is not so very different 
from Nazism Chapter 7, Snyder equates Nazi imperialism with Soviet anti-imperialism. Chapter 9, Did Soviet Partisans Cause Nazi Atrocities? Chapter 11. Technique of Deception, Anti-Semitism, A.S. In Bloodlands, this trope services the C.N. trope. The Nazis were anti-Semitic as Stalin and the Soviet leadership must be shown to have been anti-Semitic as well. This is impossible, so fabrications, F.A., and phony citations, P.C., see below, must be employed. Examples The Lie That Stalin Was Anti-Semitic Chapter 14 Did Stalin's Daughter Overhear Stalin Covering Up? Solomon Mikul's Murder Chapter 14 Anything to Make Stalin Appear Anti-Semitic? Snyder falsifies the draft letter, Chapter 14. Numbers Game, NG, Characteristics This trope also services the CN trope. For the communism-Nazism-Stalin-Hitler comparison to work, it must be asserted that the Soviets murdered very large numbers of people since the Nazis did so. Examples, More False Numbers of Victims, Chapter 13. Technique of Deception, Phony Citation, P.C. The work or works cited as evidence in support of a fact claim do not in reality support it. Examples The Lie That Stalin Spoke of an Alliance with Hitler, Chapter 8. Snyder Falsifies Stalin's Words, Chapter 14. Technique of Deception, Anti-Communist Scholarship, A.C. Characteristics Often the P.C. is taken from secondary sources by other anti-communist scholars. Example. A great many of Snyder's false fact claims are taken from AC scholars, such as these. Snyder's fundamental source, a Hitler supporter, Chapter 4. Snyder falsifies the Nalabaki Massacre, Chapter 11. Technique of Deception, False or Falsified Quotation Characteristics. This is a hybrid category. Sometimes there is no real source for the quotation at all, which makes it a special kind of F.A., a fabricated quotation. Sometimes a genuine quotation is cited incorrectly. The quotation really says and means something else. Examples. Were women routinely raped, robbed of food? Chapter 2. Snyder. Half a million youngsters in watchtowers. Chapter 4. Technique of Deception, Psychologizing, P.S. Snyder claims that Stalin was thinking something. Examples Stalin's New Malice, Chapter 3. Snyder reads Stalin's Mood, Chapter 7. Snyder claims that Stalin hated all Poles, Chapter 7. Technique of Deception, Anti-Communist Statements That Do Not Prove Anything But Sound Bad, S.B. Examples Stalin's Personal Politics, Chapter 3. Technique of Deception, First Person Accounts, FP. S example, see discussion below. First Person Accounts, FP. A final category that does not lend itself to tabular presentation is that of the first person account. Snyder uses them a lot in Bloodlands. The deception comes when, as in Bloodlands, they are used as though they can establish an historical fact. The problems of first-person accounts are as follows. They are normally collected long after the event, but memory is a creative process. Memories change, often to fit ideological assumptions made later in the person's life. Such memories are useless as historical evidence, even as evidence of the personal experience of the individual whose account it is. The principle, testis unis, testis nullis, applies in all but exceptional cases. One testimony is not sufficient to establish that an event occurred. First-person testimony is often collected in a biased, unrepresentative way. For example, the book by Kovalenko from which Snyder took his story of Petro Veldi was compiled by selecting 1,000 personal accounts of the famine of 1932 to 1933 from among 6,000 collected, but only negative accounts were published. First-person accounts are often used for their emotional appeal. The appeal to emotion has long been recognized as a rhetorical strategy to disarm rational attempts at evaluating evidence. In short, as a technique of propaganda.
Snyder uses purported first-hand accounts of the famine, even without source criticism. Some of these accounts come from the works of Nazi collaborators. Such accounts are not on evidence that any specific event actually occurred. The Petroveldi story in Chapter 1 of Bloodlands that we examined in the introduction is a good example of this. Analysis of the prevarications in Bloodlands The international success of a work as corrupt as Bloodlands requires explanation. How can a book that is largely composed of demonstrable, provable falsehoods have been published? Once published, how can it be praised by newspaper and magazine reviewers and by professional historians whose job it is to critically examine historical studies? How can a work utterly lacking in integrity be published in the hundreds of thousands of copies garner awards in several countries and be translated into dozens of languages? Part of the answer lies in the historical role of pseudo-scholarship as propaganda for anti-communist purposes. The The demonization of Soviet history dates back to the revolution itself. Already in 1920, Walter Lippmann and Charles Merce showed how the New York Times newspaper of record then as today reported the triumph of the whites and the defeat of the Reds numerous times, always falsely. Lippmann and Merce concluded that the reporters had not deliberately lied. Rather, they had reported not what they saw, but what they and their bosses wanted to see. Footnote, Walter Lippmann and Charles Merce, a test of the news, supplement to the New Republic, August 4th, 1920. End of footnote. The Times' reporters included Walter Durante, later to be attacked for being insufficiently anti-communist when in the 1930s he insisted on reporting only what he saw or knew for a fact rather than what he had not witnessed. Bloodlands was published by Basic Books, a commercial rather than an academic publisher. Academic presses require that manuscripts submitted for publication be vetted by academic specialists in the field. This does not guarantee that falsehoods will be caught and that standards of evidence, routine, and other areas of history will be observed. Nevertheless, I suspect that at least some of the more glaring falsifications in Bloodlands might well have been recognized as such by an academic review, unless the reviewers had been selected more for their anti-communist fervor than for their excellence of research. For example, there is a good chance that academic reviewers would not have permitted Snyder's account of the fraudulent Holodomor to pass without at least some qualification, and the millions of deliberate murders of the Holodomor fraud are essential to Snyder's Stalin-Hitler-Communist-Nazi comparison. Without them, he would have had no book. But academic vetting is not necessary in commercial publishing. The many awards Bloodlands has garnered from newspapers and magazines are understandable. All these publications are dogmatically anti-communist. Indeed, some of them, like the Wall Street Journal and Reason magazine, stand politically on the far right. But when it comes to hostility to Stalin, there is often little or no difference along the continuum from left liberal to neoconservative. And it is publicity and promotion from these publications that determine commercial success. Hence, nonfiction bestseller, etc., The author and his publisher are making a lot of money. Not a careful search for the truth, but profit is the goal of commercial publication. And anti-communist bias is not a barrier, but a requirement for mass commercial success. Bloodlands has not been greeted by scholars with the criticism it deserves. On the contrary, many academic specialists in the field of East European history have praised the book. Although, as the reader of the present study realizes, Bloodlands is composed of little except falsehoods concerning the actions of Soviet leaders and Soviet and communist actors, these academic reviewers have managed to miss virtually all of them. Three review forums on Bloodlands. As illustration of this fact, we here consider the first three review forums in professional historical journals that Snyder himself listed on his webpage as of April 2014. Together, they represent considered responses to Bloodlands by 13 prominent academic scholars. Book reviews and review forums are of some value if the participants really are expert in the same field as the subject of the book. But, in the present case, only two of these 13, Hiroki Kuramaya and George Babarowski, are specialists in Soviet history of the Stalin period. Both of them are on the far right of even the anti-communist scholarly spectrum. Both are passionately anti-communist and make no pretense at objectivity. Babarowski has nothing of interest to say at all. Kuramaya is the only one of the 13 who questions whether the Soviet famine of 1932 to 1933 was in fact a deliberate mass murder. But he does not draw the obvious conclusion that if the famine was not mass murder, the whole framework of Snyder's book collapses. The other twelve all accept without question Snyder's importation of the Ukrainian nationalist myth of the Holodomor. None of them seems to know that the major Western studies of the famine of 1932-1933 to by Mark Tauger, Stephen Wheatcroft, and R.W. Davies even exist. 
One of them even misspells the clearly unfamiliar term. Kurimaya is also the only one of the 13 to point out Snyder's gross error about Japanese military intentions after 1937. Footnote, see the discussion in chapter 5 of the present book, end of footnote. Aside from him, none of these scholars questions a single one of Snyder's fact claims. None of them, Kurimaya included, checks even one of Snyder's fact claims to verify whether it is based on primary source evidence or whether that evidence in, in fact supports what Snyder claims in his text. All these scholars, with the exception of the two mild demurrers by Kurimaya, simply accept every one of Snyder's assertions or fact claims about the actions of Stalin, the Soviet leadership, and communist forces. Yet, as the present study demonstrates, every one of these fact claims is false. All of these scholars repeat the verbiage about Soviet or Stalinist mass murders. Yet, as the present study has shown, the evidence is clear that the only mass murder, the terrible Ezhovchina, was not sanctioned by Stalin or the Soviet leadership. Not one of these scholars seems to know anything about this event. Not one of them knows of the long-standing scholarly debate over the Katyn massacre, and so on. Kiramaya and Babarowski aside, the rest of the reviewers, 11 out of the 13, are specialists in Nazism, or in the Holocaust of Jews, or in Eastern Europe. They show profound ignorance about the historiography of the Soviet Union during the 1930s. They are not in the least qualified to judge whether Snyder's fact claims about Soviet history are accurate or not. Of course, they themselves knew this, but none of them was forthright enough to admit it. Whether knowledgeable about the history of the Stalin era or not, all of these scholars could have done what any reviewer should do. They could have selected a few of Snyder's assertions about Soviet history and then checked Snyder's footnotes to see whether those references supported, supported what Snyder claims they support. If unable to read Polish or Ukrainian, they could have asked help from colleagues. This is elementary the kind of thing graduate students are trained to do, what PhD students regularly do in the course of researching for their dissertations. Moreover, if it is not done, then the readership is being deliberately misled. These scholars are giving the impression that they can approve or certify Snyder's research when they know they and they themselves are in no position to do so. They claim they have found Snyder's research to be good. Most of them say as much, while in reality, they are taking Snyder's book on faith, but they don't admit this. These scholars cannot escape responsibility for their endorsing Snyder's research when in reality they had no idea whether it is good or not. However, it is not only a question of their individual failures, it is the system of academic review as it exists. They simply acted in accordance with it. It is the system itself that is really at fault. For her review to be of any value to others, a reviewer of a scholarly book has to be an expert on the same subject as that of the book itself. Then she has to spend serious time and effort studying the book and its research. But this seldom happens. Book reviews count little in a scholar's career, so few scholars spend much time on them. If the book is on a subject the scholar knows very well, then her independent judgment can indeed be of value. But when, as in this case, the book is on a subject that the scholar knows little or even nothing about, her judgment is worthless. The scholar should either recuse herself or write only about those aspects of the book she is expert on, and openly admit that she does not know enough about the other parts of the book to have any opinion about them, but none of the reviewers in these three review forums were forthright enough to do this. Therefore, their endorsements of Snyder's book are dishonest. They misled their readers. To understand how this can happen, we must briefly examine the system of anti-communist pseudo-scholarship on Soviet history of the Stalin period that not only permits but lavishly rewards dishonest works like Bloodlands. Objectivity. In any field of study, it is essential that the researcher determine to be objective from the outset of his study. History is no different. The historian must make every effort to survey all the primary sources that bear upon his subject and all the secondary sources that study this evidence regardless of whether these secondary sources reflect the same biases, preconceived ideas, or values as his own. Since objectivity is, among other things, an attitude of distrust of the self and of one's own preconceived ideas and biases, the historian must compensate for her own limitations by trying especially hard to give a supportive reading to primary and secondary sources whose tendency is opposed to her own biases and preconceived ideas. At the same time, she must determine to be especially suspicious of that evidence and those works of scholarship that tend to confirm or agree with her own biases. 
to counteract her natural tendency to look with special favor upon statements that reflect her own views. In her historical practice, the historian must observe the tenets of objective research from the outset and even before. If the historian does not begin with a determination to find the truth, no matter whose ox is gored, ready at every moment to discover a truth that she finds disillusioning, her research is doomed. He will never stumble across the truth by accident along the way. Moreover, if an historian does not begin from a determination to discover the truth, we must ask the question, what then is her purpose in writing her book? If she is not out to discover the truth and report it to her readers, what is she doing? Snyder ignores every tenet of historical objectivity. Therefore, no one should be surprised that his book is devoid of historical truth. It could not be otherwise. Anti-communist scholarship. Snyder's determined flouting of objectivity would be of little consequence if it were an exception. Bloodlands and similar works would be rejected during the vetting process and not be published. Those works that for whatever reason managed to evade the vetting process and be published anyway would be quickly critiqued. Their errors, carelessness, and deliberate dishonesty identified and exposed. Negative reviews would warn potential readers away. This is how the system of scholarly and semi-popular reviewing is supposed to work, but in reality it does not work this way. Scholarship on the Stalin period in the Soviet Union is constrained by an informal but strict code of political correctness. Stalin must be depicted as a moral monster and the Soviet Union during his time as a place of government-sponsored mass murder and repression. No substantive deviation from this formula is tolerated. Only rarely can one find a refutation of even the most absurd accusations of crimes by Stalin. In his 2010 study that concluded that Stalin did not have a hand in the murder of Sergei Kirov in Leningrad on December 1, 1934, Matthew Leno felt compelled to write a two-page profession of his anti-communist and anti-Stalinist convictions. Leno admits that he did so lest someone should suspect him of being pro-Stalin for rejecting an interpretation which had been abandoned by Soviet and Russian experts for decades and for which there had never been any evidence in the first place. Even this is an exception claims that Stalin committed some crime, no matter how poorly supported by evidence, are typically passed over in silence if really absurd and otherwise are accepted and even repeated as Snyder does many times in Bloodlands. In history of the Stalin period, a kind of Gresham's Law prevails, where bad scholarship drives out the good. When good scholarship is produced, it is carefully written so as to not contradict any tenets of anti-Stalinism that the researcher thinks may be an inviolable part of the anti-Stalin paradigm. Good research is being done in the field of Stalin-era Soviet history, but it is typically confined to the close examination of primary sources, especially when newly available primary sources are used. Research that is narrowly focused on specific events, places, and time periods can be very revealing even when marred by bias. Research that reproduces new primary sources can be valuable because flawed interpretation can be discarded and the texts of the primary sources themselves appropriated for more objective research. An anti-communist scholarly environment or industry has been created where scholars churn out anti-communist falsehoods and then cite each other's falsehoods as evidence that the falsehoods are true. Primary sources are distorted by misinterpretation or ignored entirely. The scholars or academic practitioners in this industry assume in their writings that it is not primary source evidence and its interpretation but the consensus of anti-communist researchers that establishes a statement as true. Snyder follows this practice with enthusiasm. Bloodlands is a product of it. Snyder rarely cites primary sources at all. When he does, he gets them wrong. For the most part, Snyder cites secondary sources by scholars of the anti-communist industry. This produces a body of anti-communist pseudo-scholarship based upon bias alone that is upon ignorance. In addition to falsehood, this system reproduces ignorance. Anti-communist scholars inevitably become lazy when no one criticizes their research because it has the correct anti-communist tendency or line. Why worry about the truth if what matters is not objectivity and skillful analysis and interpretation of primary source evidence, but in striking the right anti-communist tone? Why bother to do the hard, time-consuming work of real research of discovering the truth when the path to academic success is to repeat anti-communist assertions without regard to the evidence. Our study of Bloodlands has disclosed that Snyder is not only biased, 
he is also ignorant about much or most of the history of which he poses as an expert. His readers should not assume that Snyder has worked hard to discover the truth and then gone on to construct deliberate lies in order to disguise this truth. The reverse is much more likely, that Snyder has no idea what the truth is because he has never tried to find it. He has mastered the anti-communist position or line on many issues, and this can be got from reading the works of a limited number of recognized anti-communist scholars without troubling oneself about primary sources or real research of any kind. End of chapter 15 Conclusion The Missing Crimes of Stalinism An Attack on the Enlightenment in Chapter 4 of Bloodlands, Snyder accuses the Soviet Union of, quote, an attack on the very concept of modernity, or indeed the social embodiment of enlightenment, end quote, page 153. In Chapter 7 of the present book, we proved Snyder's accusation to be fraudulent. But it is true of Snyder's book. In virtually every accusation he makes against Stalin, the Soviet Union, or pro-communist forces, such as pro-Soviet partisans in the Red Army, Snyder thrusts falsehoods at his readers and calls them the truth. Bloodlands is a work completely devoid of integrity. It is a cloth woven of lies and falsifications from beginning to end, an outrage against the canons of historical research and the historian's responsibility. As such, it is itself an attack on the Enlightenment, debauching history to serve political ends. Failure of the Field of Soviet and East European History Bloodlands has received many very positive reviews by professional historians in historical journals. A few reviewers have questioned Snyder's historiographical or theoretical paradigm. Still others, experts on the history of the Jewish Holocaust, have criticized him for his tendency to repeat the nationalist mythologies of today's right-wing Eastern European regimes. But at the time of this writing, I have yet to read a single review of Bloodlands where the reviewer is knowledgeable about the history of the Soviet Union during the 1930s and brings that knowledge to bear in the discussion of Snyder's book. Even reviewers who raise criticisms of other aspects of Bloodlands accept Snyder's fact claims about the actions of Stalin, the Soviet leadership, and pro-Soviet forces. Yet, any specialist in Soviet history of this period who has kept abreast of the scholarship and recently published documents could not fail to find a great many false statements in Snyder's presentation. Here are two examples from major history journals. In his review of Bloodlands, footnote, great men in large numbers under theorizing a history of mass killing, Contemporary European History, 21-2-2012, pages 133-143, to end of footnote, Thomas Kuna rightly criticizes Snyder for his move to link Soviet and Nazi crimes, quote, As it seems to reduce the responsibility of the Nazis and their collaborators, supporters, and clackers, it is welcomed in rightist circles of various types, German conservatives in the 1980s who wanted to normalize the German past, and East Europeans and nationalists today, who downplay Nazi crimes and upplay communist crimes in order to promote a common European memory, that merges Nazism and Stalinism into a double genocide theory that prioritizes East European suffering over Jewish suffering, obfuscates the distinction between perpetrators and victims, and provides relief from the bitter legacy of East Europeans' collaboration in the Nazi genocide. End quote. Kuna is certainly right that Snyder's book plays to the right-wing nationalists of Eastern Europe, but Kuna accepts without question Snyder's viewpoint about purported Soviet, often Stalin's, or Stalinist crimes. Quote, Snyder is not the first to think about what Hitler and Stalin had in common and how their murderous politics related to each other. The Hitler-Stalin pact is the actual springboard of the two dictators' collaboration in the destruction of Poland. The links between Hitler's and Stalin's mass murder policies. Stalinist and Nazi terror, end quote. Quote, 
Stalin's victims need to be included in these stories as well, he points out, that is, victims of Ukrainian Holodomor death by hunger, of the Great Terror in 1937 to 1938, and not least of Stalin's ethnic cleansing and anti-Semitic purges around and after 1945. An account on the mass crimes of the Nazi and Soviet regimes, which infamously turned people into numbers, end quote. None of these accusations against Stalin and the Soviet leadership are interrogated in the least. Kuna just accepts them as established, though where they have supposedly been established and by whom, he does not say. As the reader of this book will now realize all these statements are false, Stalin had no murderous politics. There was no collaboration in the destruction of Poland. Stalin had no mass murder policies. There was no Stalinist terror. There was no Holodomor, but a great famine in which the Soviet government, by all evidence, did the best it could. There was a great terror, or Ezhovchina, but it was not that of Stalin or the Soviet state. Stalin had no ethnic cleansings or anti-Semitic purges. The Soviet regime committed no mass crimes. In Critica, a journal specializing in Russian and Soviet history, Michael Wilt, footnote, Wilt Review of Bloodlands in Critica, Explorations in Russian and Eurasian History, 14-1, Winter 2013, 197-206, end of footnote, is rightly critical of Bloodlands on many counts, but Wilt shows no knowledge of scholarship on the Soviet Union, and so he takes the following assertion straight from Snyder's book without any question, much less examination. Quote, the two most murderous regimes of the first half of the 20th century. And while the Nazi regime killed about 10,000 people in concentration camps and prisons before the outbreak of World War II in 1939, the Stalinist leadership had already allowed millions to die from hunger and had shot about one million people. Stalin's crimes. The first events, Snyder recounts of the deaths from hunger during the early 1930s of millions of people not only in Ukraine but also in Kazakhstan and other parts of the Soviet Union. These deaths were due to the arbitrary and rash collectivization of agriculture organized by the Stalinist leadership in Moscow. After the catastrophic harvest of 1931, which was partly a result of collectivization, the Stalinist leadership exported grain in order to be able to purchase industrial goods abroad. It consciously accepted the mass deaths that resulted from this policy. In December of that year, Stalin decreed that kolkhozes that could not meet their grain delivery quotas should also deliver their seeds to the authorities. Thus, in 1932 to 1933, death from hunger became an ineluctable fate for millions of people. Stalin was certain that the peasants falling short of grain delivery quotas was proof of their collaboration with foreign enemies and of their resistance, both of which had to be quashed ruthlessly. Between 1934 and 1939, when popular fronts against fascism were formed in Europe, the Soviet repressive organs shot about 750,000 people as alleged enemies of the people and deported an even greater number to the Gulag, the local secret police arrested and murdered according to quotas from above. The Stalinist regime also murdered according to ethnic criteria as, for instance, in the so-called Polish operation, the assumption that Soviet citizens of Polish nationality were enemies of the Soviet system. A non-aggression treaty on 23rd of August 1939, which amounted to nothing less than yet another German-Russian partition of Poland. The Polish elite was shot or deported. The systematic murder of about 15,000 Polish officers who had fled from the German troops in the east, literally decapitated in the Polish army. Snyder is correct in emphasizing the commonalities in the violent practices of the two regimes in Poland. Both Germany and the Soviet Union desired the decapitation of Polish society and the ruthless exploitation of the remaining civilian population through forced labor. Both sides waged an ethnic war against the Poles. The millions of dead from famine in the Soviet Union at the beginning of the 1930s were the consequence, no doubt a foreseeable consequence, and one that the Stalinist regime deliberately accepted, of a brutal industrialization policy carried out at the expense of the rural population. End quote. Every one of these claims has been disproven in the present book. Many of them, such as Snyder's account of the famine of 1932 to 1933, which Wilt echoes uncritically here, have been disproven by respectable Western scholars. The official version of the Katyn massacre has been under sharp criticism by some Russian scholars for 15 years. Highly anti-communist and anti-Stalin, Russian scholars have shown that the USSR did not murder according to ethnic criteria in the Polish operation. Wilt appears oblivious to all of this. Why do Wilt and Kuhn repeat Snyder's fact claims about the Soviet Union uncritically, when they are by no means uncritical of other aspects of Bloodlands? In part, 
it is because neither knows much about Soviet history, Wilt admits as much. Quote, here I should register the caveat that I am a specialist of Nazism, not Soviet collectivization, end quote. Nobody can be a specialist in everything. But most of Snyder's book is about Soviet, not German actions. Why did Kuna and Wilt agree to review Bloodlands, when each of them knows he is unqualified to have an independent judgment on Snyder's statements about Soviet actions? I suggest that the reason is that the anti-communist paradigm in the form of anti-Stalinism is simply taken for granted in academia in a way that statements about, for example, Hitler and Nazi Germany are not. The scholarship on Hitler is meticulous and detailed. Misstatements about Nazi actions and crimes are caught, parsed, and subjected to criticism. But claims of Stalin's crimes are accepted without any interrogation at all. How could this happen? No scholarly field should function like this. It is a disgrace that a book like Snyder's could be published and widely read for years, while his falsifications, phony references, dishonest use of sources, and incorrect statements pass not only unchallenged but accepted, even praised by professional historians. Any graduate student in this field could check Snyder's evidence and find what I have found, that every allegation of crimes against Stalin and the Soviet leadership is false. Could a collapse of the historian's responsibility of this magnitude happen in any area of American or British history? Always accepting the history of the communist movement in those countries? I doubt it. The spectrum of viewpoints in those fields is too broad. There are no sacred cows so firmly ensconced as such that all criticism or all praise of them is a priori rule that abounds. There is no excuse for the ease with which statements about crimes of Stalinism unsupported by primary evidence, have been and continue to be accepted as truth. But there is an explanation. From its inception as an academic discipline, the primary function of Soviet studies has been to provide a fount of anti-communist propaganda, propped up by scholarship or the appearance of it. For several generations, anti-communist Russian exiles were among the most prominent figures in the field. Their anti-communist bias was enhanced by the advent of the Cold War and abetted by an influx of Soviet defectors, some of them former Nazi collaborators. The range of viewpoints acceptable in the field Field has been stretched to include Trotskyists and socialists of the social democratic type, but pro-communist viewpoints and researchers with an openly pro-communist orientation have always been excluded. This makes sense once one recalls that this field was created as a weapon against Soviet communism from the beginning. More than two decades after the end of the Soviet Union, the field of Soviet history remains first and foremost a weapon of political and ideological warfare. It has never encompassed those who challenge what I have called the anti-Stalin paradigm of Soviet history. Anyone who insists on drawing conclusions about Soviet history based upon evidence rather than upon ideological grounds. The strength of the anti-Stalin paradigm. Indeed, in important respects, the ideological blinders in this field have hardened since the end of the USSR because of the post-Soviet states. Ukraine and Poland, and in a somewhat different way, Russia too, have constructed national mythologies along rigidly anti-communist lines and upon historical falsehoods. Today, a professional historian in the field of Soviet or Eastern European history cannot get published get access to archives, be invited to historical conferences, in short, have a career, if she seriously questions the mendacious historical mythologies propagated by the political and academic elites in these countries, such as the Katyn Massacre, the Holodomor, or the Innocence of Marshal Tukhachevsky or Nikolai Bukharin. The history of the Soviet Union is fatally constrained by the anti-Stalin paradigm, it is simply not done, virtually taboo, to find Stalin not guilty of some crime or other he has been charged with. If the evidence does not support the anti-Stalin conclusion, then so much the worse for the evidence. It will be ignored, or phony evidence will be invented, or conclusions based on no evidence at all. Utter falsehoods are acceptable, as long as they conform to the paradigm of Stalin as evil. Footnote. The present author has demonstrated this in detail with respect to the December 1st, 1934 murder of Sergei Kirov, Leningrad party leader, C. Grover Fur, the murder of Sergei Kirov, history scholarship, and the anti-Stalin paradigm, Kettering, Ohio, Erythros Press and Media, LLC, 2013.
End of footnote. The sad fact is that in its broad outlines, the field of Soviet history functions more like propaganda than like history. Good research is done on very specific topics, especially when based on archival evidence, but the framework or paradigm of Soviet history during the Stalin period in which such studies situate themselves sets firm limits on what conclusions are acceptable. The academic field of Soviet history of the Stalin period is governed by a form of political correctness far more than it is by normal canons of historical research. This is the context in which Snyder's disgraceful book, one that is nothing but falsehoods, falsifications, rumors, and lies, can receive positive reviews, not just from obvious ideologues in the media or avowedly pro-capitalist organizations and publications, but from professional academic historians. What can we do? The most basic conclusion of this book concerns Snyder himself. Nothing he writes about Stalin, the Soviet Union, communism, or Eastern European history can be assumed to be accurate. Every claim he makes must be double-checked. After all, that is what this book presents, a check of every statement of an anti-communist tenor that Snyder makes in Bloodlands, with the result that all of them are false fabrications. A scientist who is exposed as guilty, not just of making an error here and there that is inevitable, but of nothing but errors, of making nothing but false statements, and therefore of reporting nothing but false results, would be distrusted by fellow scientists forever thereafter. Science functions on the presupposition that the scientists of the past have reported truthful results in their work, results which can be used in the future work of other scientists. We would not trust the research of a biochemist hired by the Tobacco Institute to provide evidence that cigarette smoking was not causally related to lung cancer. We would assume his research was, in reality, not research at all, but propaganda aimed at a preconceived and false result. Distrust. Historians work in an analogous way. One historian who does false research and reports untruthful results is a threat to the field as a whole. His work should never be cited, since it cannot be trusted, like the biochemist hired to produce genuine-looking but phony research to support a preconceived conclusion. A historian who writes anti-communist propaganda in the guise of research has produced not history, but propaganda. He has violated the canons of the historical profession. His work can never be trusted again, but distrusting Snyder's work in the future is too narrow a response to bloodlands. Snyder has failed to find a single crime of Stalinism, despite his own best efforts and those of a battalion of Polish and Ukrainian academics. If they had found any such crimes of Stalinism, we can be sure that they would have reported them, but they did not find any hints all the falsifications. This means that, as far as Soviet history of the Stalin period is concerned, all allegations of crimes of Stalinism, crimes of communists, should be reflexively distrusted. We should be even more suspicious when such allegations emanate from persons with a preconceived ideological anti-communist commitment. A renewed insistence upon objectivity. We need to distrust anti-Stalin allegations and anti-communist stories unless and until we can verify them ourselves. But... We also need to take steps to ensure, as far as possible, our own objectivity in historical inquiry. Everyone has preconceived ideas. It is one's own preconceived ideas and biases that are most likely to mislead one. To maintain a determination to be objective, a historian must develop the habit of A, giving an especially generous reading, suspending doubt and suspicion to a considerable extent, to any evidence that appears to go contrary to one's own preconceived ideas, and B, adopting an especially critical attitude towards any evidence that tends to support one's own preconceived ideas or ideological positions. A further technique is to have colleagues who are aware of your preconceived ideas and commitments give a critical pre-publication reading to your research, having been asked in advance to be on the lookout for places where you may have unintentionally allowed your own prejudices to override your commitment to objectivity. The Falsehoods of Polish Nationalist Mythology Snyder has chosen to adopt the framework bias and falsehoods that characterize the work of Polish anti-communist nationalist historians. We have checked the evidence cited by Snyder in support of his fact claims and found that it is fraudulent. 
Either it doesn't exist at all, or it points to conclusions different from the conclusions Snyder draws, even contrary to what he claims. Since, in the main, Snyder is rehashing Polish nationalist mythology, we have, in effect, examined the main premises of that mythology and show it to be false. Specifically, we have examined and refuted the following myths. The Kreshi, Wyshnodny, Eastern Borderlands, the Polish term for the Western Ukraine and Western Belarusia, were inalienable parts of Poland. Myth. Fact. The Kreshi became part of Poland in 1921 through military conquest in an imperialist war with Soviet Russia. The Polish government held no plebiscites to ask the population whether they wished to be in Poland or not. The Kreshi never had a majority Polish population. Poland had every recourse to a large-scale program of settling Poles, mainly military men, in these areas in the hopes of Polonizing them, making them more Polish. These settlers became the imperialist infrastructure of the Kreshi. Myth. The Second Polish Republic of 1919 to 1939 was a decent society to which its citizens owed loyalty. Fact. Poland was strongly imperialist. The Polish army seized Vilnius from Lithuania in 1922 and the Chechen area of Czechoslovakia from that country in October 1938. As late as January 1939, Polish Foreign Minister Josef Beck told German Foreign Minister Joachim von Ribbentrop that Poland had aspirations to the Black Sea, that is, to take over about half of present-day Ukraine. Polish nationalist historians never discuss these land grabs as imperialist. The long-term aim of the Polish ruling elite was a Poland with the borders of the 18th century when the Grand Duchy of Poland and Lithuania encompassed western Ukraine to the Black Sea and most of present-day Belarus. The Polish leadership cared nothing for the desires of the populations of these areas. The Polish ruling elite was viciously racist. Only Roman Catholics were considered Poles. All minorities suffered significant discrimination, which increased during the late 1930s. Myth. The Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact was a plot to destroy Poland and provided for a joint German-Soviet invasion. Fact. This is false. The MR Pact divided Poland into spheres of influence, requiring that the German army would have to withdraw from eastern Poland. This pact would have preserved an independent Polish state if the Polish government had not abandoned the country and its inhabitants to the Nazis. Myth. The Soviet Union invaded Poland on September 17, 1939. Fact. There was no such invasion. The USSR occupied western Ukraine and western Belarusia to prevent the Wehrmacht German army from marching up to the Soviet border. The USSR's claim that it remained neutral in the German-Polish war was accepted by all the Allies except the Polish government in exile. Myth. Hitler's Germany and Stalin's Soviet Union were allies. Fact. There was no alliance of any kind. The MR Pact was a non-aggression pact. Myth. German and Soviet troops held a joint victory parade at Brist-Litovsk. Fact. The parade was a handing over of power from the German army to the Red Army, since under the MR Pact, Brest was within the Soviet sphere of influence. Footnote. A related myth is that the Nazi Gestapo and the Soviet NKVD held three conferences at which the killing of the Polish elites was planned. There is no evidence whatever for such conferences. Not all Polish nationalists make this specific claim today. Snyder does not mention it. End of footnote. Myth. In April and May 1940, the Soviets shot about 22,000 Polish prisoners, including officers, in a series of mass murders known as the Katyn Massacre. Fact. As of 2013 at the latest, some historians would choose a much earlier date. We have clear evidence that the official version of the event known to history as the Katyn Massacre is false. Since the late 1990s, there has been a significant and very interesting scholarly dispute over the supposed Katyn Massacre and the documents that purport to establish it as a fact. Snyder wrote Bloodlands during this period, but he never informs his readers about this dispute. In this, he again follows the template of Polish nationalist historians and of anti-communist writers generally. The myth of the Katyn Massacre is central to right-wing Polish nationalism and important to anti-communist discourse generally. In anti-communist scholarship, it is considered taboo, akin to Holocaust denial to question Catton, regardless of the evidence. At the very minimum, no one interested in the truth should pay any attention whatever to any account of the Catton massacre that does not include a thorough and objective account of the historical dispute over this subject, including full discussion of the numerous Russian language studies by Russian scholars who have long rejected and claimed to have disproven the official version of Catton. Myth. 
After taking them back from Poland in September 1939, the Soviets were guilty of atrocities and terror in the former Kreshi. Fact, there was no terror. Anti-communist historians use the word terror to describe the arrests and deportation of the Polish imperialist settlers in 1939 to 1941. Claims of communist, Soviet, or Stalinist terror or atrocities are a verbal ploy that serves to avoid the issue of Polish imperial conquest and racist oppression in, Eastern, in Western Ukraine and Western Belarusia. Myth the myth of Polish victimhood. Post-1939, Polish nationalism claims that Poland was victimized by two invasions, the German and the Soviet, in September 1939, which destroyed the Polish state. This is false. In reality, the Polish state disappeared because, in an unprecedented act of betrayal, the Polish government abandoned the country, leaving it without a government. We have shown this in our extensive discussion on the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact and the German-Polish War of September-October 1939. Myth, the myth of Polish heroism. Fact, many Poles did indeed heroically fight against the Germans, but the home army, the armed force of the Polish government in exile in Paris until June 1940 thereafter in London, also fought communist partisans with whom they were supposedly in alliance. The home army routinely murdered Jews who were hiding from the Germans. Some home army commanders collaborated with the Germans, see below, fighting against communist partisans, murdering Jews, and collaborating with the Germans is not heroic behavior. The Polish People's Army, AL, and the pro-Soviet Polish Army, WP, led by Zygmunt Berling, did fight the Germans heroically. They did so without anti-Semitic terror or collaboration with the Germans. These forces were pro-communist and led by communists. Praising Polish communist forces or expressing pride in their accomplishments is taboo in mainstream Polish nationalist historiography because that historiography promotes not truth but political correctness in the form of anti-communist lies. Myth. Poland faced two totalitarianisms, Nazi Germany and the USSR. Fact. This is false, just another verbal ploy, a play on words. For the most part, the term totalitarianism has no fixed meaning. It is simply an epithet meaning bad. It is sometimes used to refer to a state with only one political party. Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union each had only one legal political party, but Nazi Germany and the USSR were diametrically opposite in every other way. Moreover, the existence of multiple political parties does not constitute real democracy. Capitalist countries typically have multiple parties while being run by the wealthy, either openly or behind the scenes. Poland was much more similar to Nazi Germany than the Soviet Union was. Like Hitler's regime, the Second Polish Republic was authoritarian, imperial realist, anti-communist, anti-labor, fiercely racist, against ethnic minorities, viciously and officially anti-Semitic and militarist. Most important, it was capitalist. Not surprisingly, many leading Polish politicians and intellectuals admired Hitler and Nazi Germany. Myth, the Soviets betrayed the heroic Warsaw Uprising. Myth, the murderous Post-war, Polish underground was a heroic war for freedom and liberation. Why tell lies if the truth is on your side? Since the end of the Soviet Union in 1991, a flood of primary source documents from former Soviet archives have gradually been made available to researchers. I have been locating, obtaining, and studying these documents. More precisely, those among them dealing with the Stalin period and the historical controversies about it, for more than a decade. Based on this reading and research, I studied Nikita Khrushchev's famed secret speech to the 20th Congress of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union of February 25th, 1956. To my amazement and to no little discomfort, I made the astounding discovery that every single accusation leveled by Khrushchev in that speech against Stalin and Lavrenti Beria is demonstrably false. Footnote. All but one minor accusation, which I could neither confirm nor disprove. See Fur. Khrushchev lied in the footnote to date. No one, specifically no historian of the Soviet Union, has challenged any of the results of my study. Khrushchev has no defenders. The implications of the fact that Khrushchev did nothing but lie and falsify in that world-shaking speech prompted me to scrutinize other assertions. Fact claims that Stalin or the Soviet government of the 1930s committed some atrocity, crime, or other. I read Bloodlands soon after it was published, and immediately recognized from my previous research that at least some of the assertions of crimes Snyder makes are false. I proceeded 
to formulate the hypothesis that many, perhaps even most, of Snyder's accusations of crimes against Stalin and the Soviet Union would turn out to be false. As it turned out, my hypothesis was correct, but it was also incorrect. I did not expect to discover that not many, not most, but virtually every accusation involving the claim of a crime of one kind or another, every crime alleged by Snyder against Stalin, the Soviet Union, and pro-Soviet forces would turn out to be false. Yet, that is the case. No ideological bias of mine, but the evidence itself demands this conclusion. Anyone who reads Snyder's book will see that he has tried to include any and all crimes and misdeeds that can be alleged against Stalin and the Soviet Union between the period of collectivization virtually until Stalin's death in 1953. It is worthy of note that Snyder wasn't able to find even a single genuine crime. This bears repeating. Not one of the crimes alleged by Snyder against Stalin and the Soviet leadership is genuine. All are fabrications. Snyder was unable to find a single example, not even one, of a crime that really was committed by the Stalin and or the Soviet leadership. The implications of this fact should be considered. Snyder has not done all his research by himself. He has had the resources of many ideologically committed anti-communist researchers of Eastern Europe especially of Poland and Ukraine, whose governments sponsor research facilities specifically devoted to fabricating tales of communist atrocities. It appears that some of these professional anti-communist researchers may have helped Snyder. In addition, Snyder has been able to draw on decades of publication by well-funded Cold War publicists and propagandists. Snyder has also had at his service the magnificent bibliographical and research facilities of the major research libraries and institutes of the world, and yet despite all these resources, human and material, Snyder has not been able to find even a single crime that Stalin or the Soviet leadership of his day was guilty of. He has not been able to identify even a single genuine crime of Stalin or crime of Stalinism. He has had to fabricate them all, or more often, to repeat fabrications alleged by others before him. Where are the crimes of Stalinism? It is in principle impossible to prove a negative. You can only prove a positive. You can't prove that Mr. X was not present in, say, Moscow on a given date and at a given time. All you can do is to prove that Mr. X was somewhere else, say, Leningrad, on that same date and at that same time. This means that in principle no one can prove that Stalin and the Soviet leadership at his time did not commit even a single crime, that the set of events that historians conventionally call crimes of Stalinism is an empty set. However, the fact that the combined efforts of all the anti-communist, anti-Stalinist researchers in the world over a period of more than 70 years, all the king's horses and all the king's men, Footnote, from the British nursery rhyme, Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall, end of footnote, and with the facilities of all the world's best libraries and archives, have not been able to come up with a single genuine crime of Stalin of the period 1932 to 1945. This is a fact that is worthy of attention. It is strong evidence in support of the negative conclusion that there were no such crimes of Stalin, for if there were any such crimes, Surely these highly motivated and well-provisioned anti-communist researchers with unprecedented and privileged access to the archives would have found them by now. Of course, there are really a number of categories of acts that have been termed crimes of Stalinism. One is the category of acts that are crimes by any definition, such as deliberate killings of innocent persons. This is the empty set. The anti-communists of decades have never yet succeeded in identifying even a single one of them. The second category consists of crimes against property and the resistance of the propertied. Collectivization of agriculture deprived many rich and also many not-so-rich peasants of their private property and land. Just as the revolution of 1917 deprived capitalists of their private property in the means of production. Landlords of their estates, urban landlords of their rentable buildings, and so on. 
These were crimes by a kind of class-conscious definition, the definition of the property-owning class. At the same time, they were acts of liberation from the viewpoint of the exploited classes of workers, peasants, and many others. The liberation of Western Ukraine and Western Belarusia by the Red Army is considered a crime by the Polish nationalist imperialists. A third category is the crimes committed by members of the Soviet leadership during Stalin's period. The principal example here is the Ezhovchina, the mass murder of several hundred thousand Soviet citizens under the pretense of fighting organized counter-revolutionary groups. This was certainly a massive crime by any standard, but a truthful account of these horrendous events is not useful to ideological anti-communists because it was carried out unbeknownst to Stalin and the Soviet government, who eventually and far too late realized what was going on, stopped it, and punished the criminals. We have presented the relevant evidence in chapters 5 and 6 of the present book. Unquestionably, the Ezhov China represents a massive failure of the Soviet system. Arch Getty termed it the self-destruction of the Bolsheviks. Footnote, J. Arch Getty and Olga V. Naumov, The Road to Terror, Stalin and the Self-Destruction of the Bolsheviks, 1932-1939, New Haven, Yale University Press, 1999. Some such term certainly applies. But it was not Stalin's crime, in that he and the Soviet top leadership did not order it or wish it, and when they learned of it, they acted to stop it and punish the guilty. It is the crimes of the first kind and especially alleged atrocities, mass murders, that are the subject of Snyder's book. Without them, Snyder's attempt to compare Stalin with Hitler, the USSR with Nazi Germany, and Bolshevism with Nazism falls apart. The Crimes of Western Imperialism In the absence of such atrocities by the Soviet Union, it is the acts of Western imperialist countries, especially in the colonial world, that most closely resemble the crimes of Nazism. Not Stalin plus Hitler, but Churchill plus Hitler, Dudlier plus Hitler, Roosevelt and Truman plus Hitler. To quote again from Professor Domenico Lacerdo, quote, British and Western colonialism has long been compared to Hitler's colonialism. Gandhi used to say, in India, we have a Hitlerite government. Must we disguise it with softer terms? Hitler was Great Britain's sin. End quote. To count the millions of colonial victims of the Western democratic powers would be a large task. They certainly amount to the tens of millions. Even as concerns World War II, it is hard to be precise in calculating the crimes of the Western allies against non-combatant civilians, such as the victims of the terror bombings against Japanese and German cities, or of the two atomic bombs which could have been dropped on, for example, the Japanese Kwangtung Army, but instead were dropped on defenseless civilians, cities virtually devoid of military significance. There is the man-made famine in Bengal, India, which cost the lives of between 1.5 and 5 million persons and for which the British government was completely responsible. Footnote. Among many sources for the Bengal famine, see Mark Tauger, The Indian Famine Crises of World War II, British Scholar 1, Number 2, March 2009, pages 166 to 196, Scott Horton, Churchill's Dark Side, Six Questions for Madsuri Mukherjee, Harper's, November 4th, 2010, end of footnote. Then, shortly after the war, the murder of 40,000 Korean peasants on the island of Chiodo, where with American knowledge and support, South Korean leaders until recently Japanese collaborators sent in fascist killers against a peasant revolt in an area where peasant revolts had taken place for many years. Footnote, see John Merrill, The Chiodo Rebellion, Journal of Korean Studies 2, 1980, 139-197. This horrific slaughter is thoroughly studied by South Korean scholars, but virtually unknown in the West. End of footnote. There is the horrific mass murder, mass torture campaign by the British against the Kenyan nationalist movement. Within the last decade, major scholarly works by Western authors have begun to bring to Western attention facts about this world-class atrocity that have been well known in Kenya but suppressed in the free world. Footnote. Begin with David M. Anderson, Atoning for the Sins of Empire, New York Times, June 12, 2013. Continue with Anderson's book, Histories of the Hanged, 
The Dirty War in Kenya and the End of Empire 2006, and Carolyn Elkins' Imperial Reckoning, The Untold Story of the End of Empire in Kenya, New York, Henry Holt, 2005. End of footnote. The Vietnamese anti-imperialist struggle for independence first against France, then against Japan, then again against France, then against the United States cost the lives of between 2 and 4 million Vietnamese. None of them would have been killed if the French imperialists had simply ceded independence. During the course of this 30-year war, both French and American forces committed numerous horrific atrocities against civilians. A recent book about American atrocities in Vietnam is titled, Kill Anything That Moves. Footnote, Nick Terse, Kill Anything That Moves, The Real American War in Vietnam, New York Metropolitan Books, Henry Holt, 2013, end of footnote. This is just a short selection. The list of horrors committed by Western anti-communist nations could be greatly lengthened. One can understand, therefore, why it is important that enemies of the communist movement, who are at the same time defenders of Western imperialism and its crimes, find it so important to fabricate crimes of Stalinism. The Crimes of Eastern European Nationalists an equally powerful motive is the ideological requirements of the right-wing nationalists of the former Soviet bloc and former Soviet Union. Holocaust researchers centered around the website Defending History have increasingly come to realize and point out to others the fact that Snyder's Bloodlands has become a kind of Bible of the anti-communist nationalists whose political predecessors sided with the Nazis and helped them murder millions of Jews and others often outdoing the Nazis themselves. Snyder's book is also valued by Polish nationalists who have based their claims to legitimacy on the mythology that the pre-war Polish regime was heroic and a victim of Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union. The truth is almost diametrically the opposite. Pre-war Poland was a horrific imperialist regime, ferociously anti-labor, fiercely racist, against its non-Polish citizens. The pre-war Polish regime rejected collective security with the Soviet Union, the only policy that could have foiled Hitler's aggression. Once Hitler's forces attacked, the Polish government abandoned its first its capital, Warsaw, and then the country itself without forming a government in exile. No other government did this. This unique act of cowardice and indifference to the fate of their people guaranteed the destruction of Poland as a state and condemned the Polish population to Nazi occupation and mass murder. Poland had a shameful history of anti-Semitic attacks against its Jewish citizens, attacks that continued under German occupation and even after the war. Polish anti-Semitism was the fault of the Polish political, religious, cultural, and educational elite. It continues to be very strong on the Polish right today, despite the fact that few Jews remain in Poland. The Polish elite also encouraged racist pogroms against Ukrainians. In a previous chapter, we have quoted American scholar Jeffrey Byrd's brief description of one such anti-Ukrainian pogrom. Research done by the Polish Center for Holocaust Research and the work of the highly anti-communist scholar Jan T. Gross document the astounding extent of violent anti-Semitism, as well as anti-communism in pre-war wartime and post-war Poland. During the 1980s, the Solidarnosc Union made Marshal Pilsudski and the regime of the colonels that followed Pilsudski its symbols and its national heroes. The post-1990 capitalist Polish governmental and educational elite have made it their task to rehabilitate the pre-war Polish elite. This entails denying their crimes. It has also meant fabricating pre-war and wartime crimes by communists, and especially by the Soviet Union. Nationalism justifies nothing. The anti-communist Polish and Ukrainian researchers from whose works Snyder draws his allegations in Bloodlands have looked hard for crimes of Stalinism. Snyder has foisted their fabrications upon a Western audience largely unfamiliar with this self-serving right-wing version of history that predominates in Eastern Europe. In the present book, we have proven, citing the evidence, that all of these claims made by Snyder in Bloodlands are false. Snyder's book has won the praise of anti-communists and crypto-fascists. The Defending History site quotes enthusiastic praise for Bloodlands by a right-wing Lithuanian academic. On first glance, one might think this strange, since Snyder says virtually nothing about Lithuania, but the reason is not far to seek. 
The Lithuanian regime, like most Eastern European regimes, bases its claim to historical legitimacy and nationalism on the pre-war regime, an authoritarian, elitist, and racist dictatorship, anti-labor, anti-communist, and anti-Semitic, that was closely aligned with Nazi Germany. Important parts of this elite collaborated in the mass murder of Soviet Jews and fought on Hitler's side in the war, as in the other Baltic countries, Poland and Ukraine, nationalist soldiers went underground after the war and devoted themselves to terrorism, murder, and sabotage. This terrorist activity is officially praised as heroic in today's Baltic states as in Poland. In some cases, like that of the Ukrainian OUN, these terrorists received aid from the American CIA, just as did Al-Qaeda and Osama bin Laden four decades later. Now... The soldiers who fought for the Nazis are praised as freedom fighters, while the Red Army soldiers who liberated these countries from Nazism are called invaders and imperialists. Most post-socialist countries of Eastern Europe are dominated by anti-communist regimes that justify their reactionary policies in part by their claim to be true nationalists. All have been engaged in constructing national mythologies, false nationalist histories, all these countries, again, with very few exceptions, have turned from being allies of the Soviet Union to being allies of NATO and the United States and hostile to post-Soviet Russia. But nationalism justifies nothing. Hitler and his lieutenants were all German nationalists. The Nazi leaders who went to the gallows after Nuremberg proclaimed with their last words their devotion to Germany. We can assume they were being truthful. Like the Polish, Ukrainian, and other Eastern European nationalists, the Nazis committed their massive crimes in the name of patriotism, of the nation. The role of NATO and the United States. The United States wasted no time in taking advantage of the collapse of the Soviet Union. It attacked Iraq in 1991 and subsequently organized an embargo that killed a half a million Iraqi children. Footnote. Leslie Stahl on U.S. sanctions against Iraq. Quote. We have heard that a half million children have died. I mean, that's more children than died in Hiroshima. And you know, is the price worth it? Secretary of State Madeleine Albright, quote, I think this is a very hard choice, but the price, we think the price is worth it. 60 Minutes, American News, Commentator, Television Program, May 12th, 1996. End of footnote. In 2001, the USA led an invasion of Afghanistan and, in 2003, of Iraq that have cost the lives of at least another 100,000 innocent civilians. None of this would have been possible if the Soviet Union had remained intact. None of it could have been done or done as thoroughly without the collaboration of the new nationalist regimes of the former Soviet bloc and USSR. The stability and legitimacy of the countries of the former Soviet bloc and former USSR are of obvious importance to the American elite, which plans to keep military forces in the Middle East indefinitely. This pits the interest of the U.S. elite against those of the Russian elite. Snyder's book plays a role in delegitimizing Russia as the successor state to the Soviet Union, just as it helps to justify the far-right and even crypto-fascist politics of Eastern Europe. Apology for Holocaust perpetrators, but not only for them. Historians of the Holocaust have been the most prominent critics of Bloodlands, but neither they nor the few other critics of this book have noted the fact that Snyder has not only falsified World War II and the role of Polish and Ukrainian nationalists, though he has indeed done that. All of Snyder's claims about Soviet crimes are also false. Yet this fact has drawn virtually no attention from Snyder's critics. It seems that they do not realize it or do not object to it. This is the task that the present book takes up. The falsehoods in Bloodlands are all of a piece, both apology for anti-communist and anti-Semitic nationalists, and falsification of what the Soviet Union did. But the latter has attracted no scholarly attention until now. Snyder is a significant figure in the American intellectual life. He is a frequent columnist for the most influential intellectual journals, his book is taken as a statement of facts. His lies and falsehoods about the Soviet Union and Stalin are accepted as true. In mainstream Western intellectual circles and even on most of the left, it is taboo to question any charge against Stalin or the Soviet Union, no matter how absurd. Footnote, 
Russia is one of the few countries where some space still remains in intellectual life for honest research into the Stalin period. End of footnote. If you try to challenge them, the present author has done so. The response is, you are a defender of Stalin. Footnote. An example of an essay that takes Snyder's claims in Bloodlands as fact is Estevan Diak's review, Could Stalin Have Been Stopped? New York Review of Books, March 13, 2013. As a youth, Diak was in a labor battalion in the fascist Hungarian army that invaded the Ukraine alongside Hitler's forces and that killed at least hundreds of thousands of Soviet citizens, to say nothing of Red Army soldiers. The present author wrote a response to Diak's essay and also sent it to a few email lists. End of footnote. Therefore, the present book will inevitably be called an apology for Stalin, even for Stalin's crimes. But by now the reader knows this is false. This study is simply an attempt to get at the truth, not to defend Stalin or defend the Soviet Union, but simply to discover and document what really happened using the best evidence, research methods, and appropriate means of deduction and conclusion. Any blow in defense of the truth is a blow for the Enlightenment, for civilization, and for the future, and against the injustices not just of the past, but of the present, and against those who lie about the past to justify their exploitative practices today. May this book contribute, however modestly, towards these goals. End of Blood Lies by Grover Fur.